Hello, everybody. Hello, Bits. Everybody can hear me. I, I have seen, I've got you on my small camera here. So give me an old wave from the audience. Go, hey, yes. Loud and clear. Okay. 20 minute session. I'm not going to waste much time on the introduction. My name is Mark, working with data a long time. There's my details. Let's get into the session. A little bit of fun. This might be a little bit awkward this way. So I want you to wave vigorously if you think you know what's going on in this. We're going to do an eight second reveal. What is the historical graph going on here? What's the importance? Anyone got it? Wave for me. Wave for me. Ah, oh, no one in there. Florence Nightingale. We kind of think of visualizations as a new thing, right? I mean, there's loads of them in Power BI, other products. But we forget the fact that they're old. And they're so important in what they can do and the right visualization at the right time. So I thought I'd set the little context here a little bit by just showing us some historical ones. This is Florence Nightingale. The importance of this was it was her way of proving that hygiene matters. Because that's what she did. She kept a clean hospital and mortality rates went down. And this is how she proved it to people. Number two, wave frantically if anybody can get it. Dating all the way back from the in 1905, I think, 1904, 1905, Stan Pat. So this was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's campaign when he was running for re-election as uh, president of America. And look at all the information that he's conveying on this. Imagine having a dialogue with politicians these days like this. All right. But yet, there they were 100 years ago doing that type of dialogue with another visualization. The third one, a bit. More obscure, but actually one of my personal favorites for some personal reasons. Any ideas what it could be? Any hands waving? It's a map, right? But the importance of this map, if you look at it over here, this is the west coast of Ireland, and this is the east coast of Nova Scotia. And that is the proposed route for the first transatlantic glo global crossing cable in 18. 1860s, 1860s by Cypress Field. But the important thing about this visualization is not the bit above it, it's the bit underneath it, which is where he basically plotted out, here is the depth of the ocean. And this allowed him to convince investors that it was possible, that there was no huge mountain range, that it was relatively speaking, once he got off the cliff of Ireland, once he got off the cliff of Ireland, it was relatively flat all the way across. And that allowed him to raise $7 million to put the first transatlantic cable, of which, if you look at me, that is an example of it. That is part of the original cable that went across the Atlantic, hooking up Europe and America, dropping communication times from 12 days to hours. Number four. And this one is from William Playfair, an economist, an economist. Um, died 1844, I think. I'm just going to check it on there. Uh, 1840, 42. 1842 died. So this is one of his last visualizations. You might see this today translated as, say, um, average salary relative to mortgage. But actually, if you look at the detail in this one, and uh, if you try to read what's in the middle in there, the average wages of a skilled mechanic compared to the cost of wheat. So the fundamentals to survive, food. And if you look across this in here, you can see in here that it was quite low of relatively high. They enjoyed a period of relative prosperity going on here when things closed. But then we had a huge increase in wheat again in there. A very simple graph that we might look at these days, but I mean revolutionary at the time. So that was four visuals, just to kind of well, set the context of they matter. Historically, they've always mattered. So now let's look at the visuals that we have in Power BI, because we know that there is about 40 of them, right? Inside in Power BI, and that's it. You got your line charts, your buy charts, pie charts, KPIs, a couple of other things. However, we go looking inside an app source, and at last time I counted, there's 480 additional visuals sitting inside an app source. 389 of them are free. Uh, 223 of them have a four-star rating or above, and there's about 50 publishers across that whole mix in there. So there's a lot. There's a lot more than 40 to pick from. They're grouped out by various different areas, um, comparison, correlation, changing over time. 
But really, we're just going to dive in and have a look. So first of all, we're just going to go quickly to the website. And then we're going to go look at a bit of Power BI, look at some of the visuals, and then just show you some use cases. All right. So the website is here. OK, so you can all go to this website and you can browse around and see what we have in here. And I'll see a whole bunch of ones at the top from Microsoft, another producer and other publishers of them. I can go over here and say, hey, is there any for any particularly specific industries? Is there anything in any specific categories? For example, if I was to go looking at filters, what would come up in here? I know I'm getting various different filter type of related uh, visuals in there. So straight away, if you're doing uh, some sort of project and you kind of go, I really need a kind of a filtering situation or a correlation situation or a mapping situation, you can kind of quite quickly zoom in and kind of go, well, all right, what have we got in those different areas? So that's the website, nice and simple, easy to browse. Let's go look at that website, however, inside in Power BI, all right? So first up, hands up, I confession, I would not put myself down at all as a wonderful illustrator or designer of dashboards. I'm more of an engineering person in there, but I'm kind of fascinated by this whole visual interaction area. And over time, I try to pick out ones to do different purposes, to introduce them into my slides, to kind of uh, into, in, into any projects I do, to give a little bit more insight. Anyone spot anything unusual with this particular page? I know it's hard to get the feedback in there, right? So I'm gonna pretend someone shouted from the back. None of those are the standard visuals, all right? I haven't used any of these guys in here. So to begin with, in case you've never noticed, no, known this, how do you even get a new visual put into Power BI? Well, I'm inside in Power BI desktop. I can go away, I can go over here, click on my get more visuals, click on that, up it pops. Basically gonna bring me to that same website that we we're on earlier. And from here, I can do the same exploration that I can do before. So say if I wanted to add on the radar chart inside in here, it's going to pop me up a quick bit of information about it. And I'm going to go, great, let's go add that into my chart. Once I've done that in a couple of seconds, we'll go, that's been successfully imported into my file. And now here down on my right hand side, I've got a radar chart I could add in. That's how easy they are to get. And really all I have in here are some examples of what these visuals can do in here. All right. So up on the top, I have got, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, so I'm going to check it. A uh, chiclets, chiclet slicer up at the top in here. All right. Just for changing things. Going on over here, I've got a star rating visualization. Over here, I've got the really powerful violin plot, which is actually basically telling me in here, well, I'm ranking the ratings for things. So this is the maps. And there was a good clustering around the three and a big clustering around the four. And you can see really there, they, that's getting a variety of clustering of ratings happening on in here, all right? Whereas in other guys were mayor up higher, most of the ratings that are coming in the comparison visuals are all a good solid five going on there. And then with a little nod to Florence Nightingale, I've got one of her visualizations popping in down here again, explaining the same information that we're seeing in there. I got my little US stock exchange ticker along the bottom. I'm not saying this is a wonderful visualization or a wonderful dashboard. I'm just saying this is a dashboard made up of things that do not come out of the standard part of Power BI and that are available and that are free to use. So we're just going to talk about a couple of use cases for all of these, some examples I've done with uh, clients. And you can judge for yourself. Example use case number one. Way a line chart. Wave frantically if you think it's a work of art. I hope nobody waves. You could look at this and kind of go, right, it's a line chart. It is what it is. There's something going on over here. There's a relatively flat line. There's a couple of peaks. The client who came to me about this was actually trying to measure vibrations. Vibrations in drills that make medical devices that get inserted into your body. Artificial limbs hips, these things. Completely precision measurement needed, because if it doesn't fit your body, it will fit nobody's body, in which case it goes into the bin. So vibrations matter. And this is an attempt to try to understand what are the kind of vibration readings I'm getting out of my devices, and it's not particularly insightful. Well, we throw it into um, a ribbon, and we suddenly get this. To begin with, it's got a beautiful harmonic resonance. 
all right? The fact that he's measuring uh, vibrations and this looks like this is just an added bit of aesthetically pleasing in there. But it's given me a much better sense of what's actually happening here. This is the standard. This is what I expect. Yes, there's an outlier up here. That, that, that may not necessarily be bad. This is initially for them just to measure what is. And then out of what is, they can then start to measure, well, what is maybe going wrong? So one example of an alternate visualization to get there. Example number two, a table. I won't bore you with the details. If you know anything about the Irish political system, we use a, our voting mechanism is proportional representation. So if I vote for one party, that's my number one vote, but I can vote for another individual, it's a number two, a number three, a number four, a number five, et cetera. This means that we get very interested in transfers because we vote for our first preference, they get eliminated, where do those transfers go to? And this is a table just basically listing this in an almost indecipherable manner. If I pop this on, however, suddenly I get a lot more information straight away. Probably the big three political parties in Ireland, Fine Gael, obviously as you don't stand, have a strong affiliation to transfer to other Fine Gael candidates. Sinn Féin have a strong tendency to go to other Sinn Féin candidates. But the interesting thing up in here is the Fianna Fáil party. Well, their second transfers don't tend to go anywhere else. They split evenly amongst all other parties. So if you're a party strategizer in here, you'd be kind of going, trying to target a first preference vote is very hard because that's asking a person to change their mind on their primary decision. But asking them to change their second or third preference, a bit different. This is your target. One of these parties wants to gain, that's where they got to be targeting what's going on over here. The people whose first votes are being a fall, but moving on to the other one. And that just falls straight out by looking at that visualization. Uh, use case, next use case. I call it number four, it's actually use case number three. Bar charts, right? I'm actually just going to show you another bar chart after this. But if you're looking over here, this was an attempt to measure network speed. And if you're reading this, you kind of go, well, clearly it got better, right? No argument with the numbers. But I put it into this type of box and whisker distribution. I'm still seeing the overall same shape. But now once I understand my box and whisker, I'm kind of going, well, hang a second. That's the median point in there. And yes, that's definitely up. Or that's the height of the, that, that's my outlier. That's my first deviation above. But there's the real median. Not so significant. So while I got, definitely got an overall improvement and I can expect some definite high performance speed, really I'm still stuck down here a little bit. Better, but not as big a better as maybe conveyed by the chart above. A lot of detail to understand in, uh, in a box and whisker, but actually one very insightful because it's really got your whole, it's the real data science way of looking at your data in there. I have a client who put one of these in and he was, it was a food manufacturing where moisture is very important. Moisture is very expensive, all right? To get moisture out of a product is very expensive. So they have big vents to control the moisture levels. The minute we put up one of these and he was measuring the, um, the average moisture readings, he looked at the box and whisker and he went, oh, I'll have to service one of my moisture readers because I shouldn't be seeing that level of deviation going on there at all. You know? Whereas when looking at that as an average, he'd have been just seeing, oh, yeah, on average, it's 2.3. That's what it should be. But it was bouncing from 0.6 up to 3.8 and stuff. So uh, box and whiskers. Last use case in here. An attempt to, this is to do with customer surveys, and they're trying to kind of go, well, how am I getting on in my customer feedback relative to the estate, relative to all other shops? And this is a really poor way of doing it. It's given me the idea of, well, this is how I did, and this is how the estate is doing, but we're losing all sense of proportion going in there. We put this into a uh, spider chart, however, uh, a radar chart, and we get a completely different level of insight. To begin, I can see that clearly this guy is underperforming relative to the estate. However, I can also see the estate isn't doing such a good job on the outlier points out here. This is where the estate is doing really well, and there's a bit of work to be done in here. But over this side, not so much. Again, so much more insight in that one bit of visualization is going on there. This is a 20 minute talk, so I have to keep an eye on things. We could go on longer in here. And none of those I am saying are masterpieces. As I said, I'm not really a, a design person, but they're all there. 
they're all literally at your fingertips. And sometimes it just takes five or 10 minutes of exploration to kind of go, do you know what? I'm going to try this one out. I always think with data projects, while we know that 90% of the work is before you get to do in the report, 90% of the judgment of your work will be based upon that report. So sometimes it's kind of good to do a bit of look to see if there's another, uh, something that can help you out to give you a little bit of a, an edge. Let's talk about some practical stuff. Are they secure? Well, you have to be a Microsoft partner to develop one, but that's not exactly a huge barrier to overcome. That's a little bit of admin and bang, you're a Microsoft partner. Visuals come into either certified or non-certified categories. Non-certified basically means you gotta be a partner and there's some guidelines around logos and watermarks. Certified means you have to be the partner, but more importantly, you must pass the Power BI's team code requirements. They specifically are tested that they don't access external services or resources, and they follow security code and patterns and guidelines. So if you have security concerns, certified is where you should be looking. Ironically, some Microsoft cert uh, visuals are not certified, particularly the ones to do with mapping because they do call outs to Bing to give me my mapping coordinates, which clearly breaks one of their requirements of don't access external services. So non-certified doesn't mean insecure, it just means it's not certified. You have to do your own kind of um, review and diligence around that. Uh, yeah, does not mean unsafe. Basically, check the small print. When you look at the visuals in the library itself, you'll see at the bottom, you'll see these. Uh, this can access external services and resources, while over here, this visual is certified by Power BI. So it's pretty easy to find, pretty clear up there. A little bit of chat about governance about this whole situation. There are settings you can, there are, inside Power BI tenant admin, there are some settings specifically to visuals. All right. Uh, to begin with, you can allow people to install them or not. Okay. Uh, you could turn it off. Nobody can do this. Or alternatively, you can say, well, you can do it, but you can only use certified visuals if you want to go on that way. So again, work playing with the governance settings, what, thinking what you want to do in there. There's also the concept of an organizational visual. So you might do, you might have a situation where we're not allowing people put on visuals willy nilly, but if they come to us and make a case for a particular visual. I, as, power, as, as tenant admin, will install that as an organizational visual, okay? And way that manifests itself over here is when I go get in a visual, I can go, as opposed to all the visuals in here where I'll get an error message, I can kind of go, hey, let's look at my organizational visuals. And in this case, kind of go, okay, there's my approved set of visuals that have been um, allowed by my organization that I can add on there. So keep that in mind around the running of things. Another benefit of the organizational visual is it will automatically update if there's a new version of that visual put into the app store. And any version that goes into the app store has to go through the same security compliance in there again. Just a note, you must manually add a visual to a new report. So if you had a radar, if you had a radar chart before and it says, hey, I want to use a radar chart again, and you crank up Power BI desktop, and you're looking at it, and it says, where's my radar chart gone? Yes, you do have to add it in again. It's just a little bit of a small bit of overhead in there. The only way around that one really is if you had a template that you were using in Power BI desktop, and can I go pull down my template and work on from there. Okay. Uh, but really, not not really a big complication to do that in there. And that is it. And I'm assuming I'm pretty much at my 20 minutes. Um, thank you very much for this session. I'm not quite sure how the Q&A goes. People can ping up a Q&A onto me. I'm happy to take it in here. Alternatively, contact me via Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I, the slides will be uploaded into the, uh, into the SQL bits then. Um, it's been my pleasure to talk to you. I wish I could be over with you, but uh, it's... Ours day is Patrick's day, so it's kind of big family weekend in Ireland. So uh, we're we're over here. Thank you very much for coming to the session, and uh, I hope you learned something. <laughs>